Victor Hugo's The Hunchback of Notre Dame may seem like a weird book to make into a Disney film. However, looking into it, it kind of makes sense. It's a very dark book, obviously. Victor Hugo did, didn't write stuff that wasn't all had dark themes. It's pretty much about Notre Dame, which is why it's in the title. He actually was a politician as well as a writer, and he was not happy about the destruction of Notre Dame or vandalization of it. He viewed it as a historical art piece. That should be preserved for architectural reasons. So throughout this book, he made that the main goal. He had a story of characters surrounding it, and they would all die except for the building itself. So, in case you didn't know, the original story was about. It's actually not that far off from the Disney version. A priest or high priest, if you will, named Frollo, is forced to adopt a deformed baby who he has in the, the bell tower. He's deformed, so he calls him Quasimodo, which means half form, as he mentioned in the movie. And he's deaf, too, because he's been ringing bells all the time, so he can't really hear that well. Eventually, three characters, Quasimodo, Frollo, and the captain of the guards, Phoebus, fall in love with this gypsy girl named Esmeralda, who has a plot surrounding her birth mom that really isn't that interesting, but it's only in the book. And they all fall in love with her. Frollo decides to make her a criminal when she convicts her of witchcraft, which she didn't actually even involved with. Um... Uh, Yes, and pretty much they all die. I think Phoebus doesn't die. Frollo gets her executed, and then Frollo lasts stop the tower. And then Quasimodo throws him off the <laughs> off the building. And then Quasimodo goes to her grave and cries and starves to death. Pretty sad. It's not that crazy that they wanted to make a musical out of a Victor Hugo novel. After one of his other novels, Les Miserables, I'm not sure if I said that right, I don't speak French, sorry, is a giant hit at the time, so it makes sense that Hey, let's try his other work, see if that translates well into musical. In fact, it's already been done by Victor Hugo himself. So five years after writing the original book, uh, Victor Hugo is involved with the uh, opera version of the story known as Les Esmeralda. It's more focused on Esmeralda and her love with Phoebus, which is the guy that she likes the most, making Frollo jealous, and he kills her, him, and then frames Esmeralda. He then comes back and says, I'm alive! It was Frollo! And then he dies, and Esmeralda cries over his body. And some of the other events from the book happen, except only Phoebus dies, and that's pretty much it. So it showcased from early on that the, the, there's really to be made changes for it to be lighter and to work in a mere musical base setting. So ch Disney changing the story doesn't isn't that drastic, and yeah, let's see how they adapted it. Seeing as the book is very dark, Disney decided to make a very dark film. Even in the beginning, the main villain kills a helpless woman and then tries to kill a baby. This is some dark shit. Many people have actually really loved this version of the film due to its darkness and showcasing what an anime music can be without some of the kid blockers. And what I mean by that is so much comic relief going on. Now, now there is elements of that, but they're actually very light compared to other films. It was a bold move of them to make this movie, and it ended up doing okay for themselves. Obviously, in recent years, people like it more than they did back in the day. But making a film of this nature was very uh, odd for Disney, though they did chicken out a little bit. Other than Quasimodo's mom dying in the beginning, the only other character that dies in this version is Frollo. Now, that's not an issue. As we mentioned before, there's been changes between who dies and who doesn't in the uh, previous version of Hunchback. But they have a, a very elongated fake-out death scene for Esmeralda in this film that always bothers me. This isn't a normal fake-out death. She's out of there for a very long while, and they, they basically make you convinced for a long time that she actually did, including, like, doing something that would make her wake up, but she doesn't, and then all of a sudden, she's alive. My guess is that they actually wanted to kill the character off, and they change it last minute. I'm actually sure if this is not true or not, but that's what I would guess, because it seems like they were playing on it based on the way it's set up. The Hunchback of Notre Dame doesn't have any clear magic in it, so anything that showcases anything but that is just pretty much a character hallucination. So, there's no magic going on here, like, she's not falling asleep, she actually dies. So, just very weird for the character to just immediately wake up and then, and then at the same time be able to hold up Quasimodo. Like, how is that even possible? She was so dead earlier that she wouldn't even wake up with water being in her mouth. But now she's able to hold up a grown man, not only a grown man, a very heavy grown man. Jeez, Moe. I know I'm nitpicking early on, but this scene bothers me too. Randomly, for no reason, he passes out during this scene, and I don't know why. I just really noticed this in my last viewing. Like, he's just holding on normally early on. Then Esmeralda's like, I'm gonna help you pull up. And then all of a sudden, he just passes out. Did I miss a scene here? Like, how did that happen? So I am nitpicking here, but I had to nitpick it because the rest of this film was pretty much perfect. Well, almost perfect. I gotta mention the biggest critique of this film, which are the gargoyles. Now... I'm going to say something that's pretty controversial. 
I don't mind these characters. One, they're actually not alive. They're just his hallucinations, which actually adds another layer of darkness to his character. He's so lonely that he makes up his own friends. Like in this scene where Frollo comes up, they're all alive, and in the next second, they are completely still as rock. And that just makes it showcase how bad his situation is. There's an extra layer of darkness that you don't even pick up on. But yes, even the goofy sidekick characters are just figments of the main character's imagination. And yes, while I would prefer them to either not be in the film as prevalent as they are, or written better, they don't- they aren't in it that often. Other than maybe the ending where they're actually fighting, which I guess is just another figment of his imagination, I don't really get it. They really should not be here. Yeah, sometimes the moment- some moments are a little darker, they decide to add a little bit of relief, and most of the time it isn't that jarring, but sometimes it'll- kind of is. Like, something that's very jarring to me is the fact that one of these guardsmen, it just sounds exactly like Patrick Starr. Teach you a lesson, peasant! He's ugly now, watch this! So yeah, this guy just sounds like Patrick Starr the whole time. He's not a main character, he's a minor character, very minor. But just funny, it just takes me out of the film for a second. Like, wait, why is- why is Patrick- why is Patrick Starr here? So the gargoyles aren't really that funny at all, in fact, they're really not. They're just okay. I feel like they should have been made it to one to two characters. And yeah, their song isn't that great either. And once again, it's clearly coming from his pers quasi most perspective, so it's not that big a deal. It's one song, and that's pretty much the most you get from these characters. And at least two of them are called Victor and Hugo. That's that's kind of clever. Fly, my freakish! Fly! Fly! <laughs> Now, you might think this is a really, really bad Wizard of Oz reference in the middle of a final climactic battle that's really out of place. However, it's quote-unquote clever, because you see, the uh, lyricist for this movie, is, as well as Pocahontas, is Stephen Schwartz. And he would do Wicked. So you see, it's a prediction. Just kidding, this is just a stupid fucking reference. But that is a fun fact for you. So there is things that just do not work, and the comedic scenes don't really work that well in this film. Like, at all, they go clash of the tone very drastically. But I went over the nitpicks now, because now I get to talk about what I like about this film, which is the CGI people. In order to make Paris feel more full, they use CGI for additional models, which is fine. In a shot like this, you wouldn't even notice in the first place. Maybe you could tell a little bit. But it is a neat thing to do. It actually does make the uh, city feel more filled with people, and that's a nice thing. However, it's when they're more close up, and some of the background characters look a little weird, then you can tell. Like in this shot, you can see in the front we have the animated characters, but in the back we have CGI people who are only doing one little animation. Now, it's only noticeable after multiple viewings of this film, because when you first see it, you won't really notice it unless you have a really keen eye. But yeah, it is kind of distracting how some scenes will have just normal 2D people and then random CG people who don't have a lot going on in them. Uh, they didn't do the Wildebeest justice like they did in Lion King, but it, it's okay. So what works about this film? Well, mostly everything else. The soundtrack for this film is phenomenal. There is pretty much no bad track in this song list, which is surprising. As I mentioned, I actually don't mind the Gargoyle song. It's the worst song in the movie, but still not bad. It has probably the best villain song ever made, the best opening song by a landslide, and Alan Menken's score is phenomenal on this. He used Latin Volpa opera, basically, people, to inquire shit, whatever you call it, for a lot of the background sounds, and makes this film feel even more grand and epic than it already is. They do a great job animating Paris, making it feel as big and grand as it is in real life, especially Notre Dame. This actually might be one of the best looking Disney films, to be honest. I mean, a lot of these shots in this film are just gorgeous. So with an amazing soundtrack, as well as amazing animation, you got a recipe for greatness. Now let's talk about the characters, because they're pretty good as well. First off is Esmeralda. Why did they make this character so fucking hot? Actually, I know why, because they need every, all the three main characters to simp over her like they do in the book. Even old man Frodo gets a boner for her. He even sniffs her hair. I cannot believe they put that in a Disney film. Holy fucking shit. There's some dark things in this movie, but that is just one short scene of him smelling her hair. It's probably one of the most odd things to put in a Disney film. It's so weird and dark, and I kind of like it. Frollo becomes the ultimate simp for Esmeralda because his, his Christianity blocks him from wanting to lust over a gypsy woman. So he's like, she'll die unless she chooses to be with me. Just your average Christian luster. And she has a great song number. And her psychic, they had to make up for the movie because she already had a goat in the book. So there you go, Disney, a perfect animal psychic for you. Esmeralda is a really great character. She helps out people who are less fortunate and is able to kick a lot of ass due to her skill. 
you can definitely see why a bunch of men would sip over this character in the movie because she's just a very likable character. She's down to earth and she's willing to help others even to sacrifice herself. What a nice woman. I already talked about him a little bit, but we must talk about the villain of the film. Judge Claude Frodo is considered to be one of the best Disney villains by pretty much a lot of people, and that's for a good reason. This guy is just plain out evil. But his evilness comes from a real life evil. People who think they're pious and very religious, but they're basically just prosecuting others in spite of them. He views gypsies as being just evil people, basically, while he is a perfect pious man, and anyone that's not like him deserves to be exterminated, because that's what he believes that God tells him to do. The biggest difference between him and the book version is that he's a judge here, which means he has legal power, while in the, the book and play, he's a priest. He was always meant to showcase the flaws in the the uh, church system, specifically in Christianity, how corrupt it can be, and a person with power can have even without being in legal process. But here, they guess they thought, like, hey, we'll make him a judge, so it makes sense, I guess. And now the high priest is just a nice Cogsworth guy. Isn't that lovely? Even when he's not trying to genocide a group of people, he's gaslighting his own adopted son, and even tries to kill him at the very end. This guy just represents the evil that religion can do to a person, and the views of that group group, which is what he's always meant to represent, and that's what I like about him. I like the showcasing the true evils of the world, which is too much religion, just exact screamism. What makes his vil guy go over the top to the top of the list is his villain song, Hellfire. We see him do evil things, but this is how he justifies it to himself. He talks about how he's a pious guy, but just the feeling of lust for Esmeralda makes him feel incredibly guilty. So this guilt makes him want to go out and just kill her, basically, for this. But exception, if she actually wants to be with him, she'll make an exception for that, showcasing how much of an evil guy he is and how he really knows he's bad deep and down inside. He's going to keep on doing it in order to justify it. Just this being a song in a, in a Disney movie in general is pretty crazy. This guy is literally talking about how he wants he's going to just kill a person just because he wants to fuck them. Wow, I cannot believe this is in a Disney movie. Holy shit. He hides in his house all day because he's scared while other people th may think about his gross face. The last character and the main character to really talk about is Quasimodo, who is basically just me if I was an anime character. And he makes art projects on the side. Being tied up and put to the wheels, everyone's fear if you have social anxiety. So if you have social anxiety, you can relate to this guy. I know he doesn't really have that, he's just scared because people might misjudge him for being ugly as hell. And of course he falls in love with the first girl that talks to him. Very relatable. But no, this character is actually pretty great. It has a great design and it's animated incredibly well. They have a lot of fun in this character since he's able to climb around this enormous building, so that's pretty cool. And his I Want song is very powerful. I like it a lot. I think it's a highly underrated Disney song. Just want, talking about how he just wants to be one day outside with the rest of the people being normal. It's very satisfying to see him come out at the end and people finally accept him for not being a freak. He's a great character because even though he gets his heart broken, he still does the right thing in the end. Showcasing how different he is from Frollo. Even though he looks like a monster on the outside, he is not on the inside. Unlike Frollo, who is? Even though they say that directly in the movie itself. I think that's pretty clever. It basically tells people, even if you can't get the, what you want in the end, you should always do the right thing, because you can probably get something even better. Which, for Quasimodo, was acceptance. And I love that a lot. It's why I like this movie so much. Even though there is some obvious problems of it, the good outweigh the bad by a lot. So this one has more obvious flaws than some of the other films I want to put in the S tier. In fact, this one's going to be ranked very high. It's just the good is so good. The songs are phenomenal. The animation is grand, and you feel tense in all the epicness of a film. This film basically makes me feel like how I feel during Lion King during its two epic scenes, essentially. It has tons of themes about acceptance, religious persecution, and discrimination. All, everything you would want to see in a really good, well-constructed film. While there are certain little things that just don't work that well, the little hiccups I would call them, the film always goes back on track to the grand epic story and great characterization that it does throughout most of its runtime. So even the little things like gargoyles or just little weird goofy scenes don't last very long and are always back on track. Would I like to see this movie without edit out some of those scenes? Yeah, but I'm still glad that we got we were able to even get this in the first place. This is a film that comes once in a lifetime, even from Disney, because they don't do this dark, epic movies like this very often, even nowadays. So if you want to see a Renaissance film that you haven't seen, then I'd recommend Hunchback of Notre Dame. When it comes to the external media, there isn't that much for Hunchback of Notre Dame. However, I definitely should mention the Broadway adaptation. 
this is basically the perfect version of the Hunchback because not only add, does it add some great new numbers, but also it adds more book elements. Quasimodo is back to being deaf, and Frollo is back to being a high priest. It also adds a lot of different stuff to it, but basically, all the problems that you might have with the film version, this basically fixes them, making pretty much a perfect adaptation. It even makes Frollo less villainous and more grave a character, which is definitely interesting. He's definitely a great character in the movie, but this definitely adds more dimension to his character. Unfortunately, Hunchback got a sequel, and it's considered to be one of the worst DVD sequels ever made. Not only does the film look drastically much worse than the official film, but it also does a stupid thing. Quasimodo didn't girlfriend the first one, so he gets one here. <laughs> How fucking stupid of a concept is that? Making a sequel to Hunchback Notre Dame is already fucking stupid, but then making it doing this is even more dumb. Of all the films that make a direct-to-video sequel, on Hunchback might be the worst one to do it, and they, of course they had to do it. They didn't do Robin Hood or Alice in Wonderland, which could have used one if they easily, but no, we got Hunchback 2. Fuck me in the ass. There is no live-action remake for Hunchback, or in the plans for all I know. There is apparently going to be a TV show just called Esmeralda, I guess based off the opera one. Who knows exactly what's going to be. So, yeah. There isn't much Hunchback Notre Dame video games, there's only one, really one, that being Topsy Turvy games on the PC, and as well as Game Boy. It's another one of those mini-game collections that we've seen a lot on these Disney uh, game adaptations. Here's what the Game Boy Color version looks like. Yeah. And like most of the animated movies coming out this time, there's also an animated storybook for Hunchback of Notre Dame. I talked about these and I pretty much read the review, so you know exactly the gist of these. They are a fun game for your little kitties. And that's pretty much it for Hunchback and Notre Dame in video games. In fact, they don't even make that many cameos in other games. Like, for example, they are only in one Kingdom Hearts games on 3DS, so that says a lot. When it comes to Disney Parks, there's not a whole lot. In Hong Kong Disneyland, they have Klopun's Festival of Fools, which is a basic sit-down area that you see a lot of Disney Parks. Not a full-on restaurant, just a little eatery, so that's interesting to see. For a short time at Hollywood Studios as well as Disneyland, you'd also see a abridged version of the movie adapted onto the stage. That's very nice. This ended in 2002 for Disney uh, Hollywood Studios and 98 in Disneyland. I put Hunchback at the top because I like it a lot. I like watching it every, pretty much all the time. It is one of my favorite Disney films. I just well, actually one I didn't grow up with actually, so it's kind of shocking to see it that high. I do like it quite a bit, I, for all the reasons I mentioned. There are some obvious flaws, but sometimes there's a movie, you know the movie's good, when you just feel like those flaws don't matter as much. And most of the flaws I kind of notice in more recent things, and some things that people complain about like, don't bother me. I don't know why I'm having trouble talking today, but I just am. So Esmeralda is not technically a princess at all, but we'll just claim that she's a princess of Notre Dame. Princess of France. Not the best, uh place to be princess of because of the French Revolution, but, you know, whatever. Just ignore that. Just ignore the fact the other book, Victor Hugo wrote, was about the French Revolution. Let's ignore that. Anyway, Cleo, uh, what is, what is it, Cleopatra? What the fuck? <laughs> Esmeralda, she's a top-tier babe. I don't know what to say. She can play the tambourine. She's got a pet goat. She can kick ass. She does all that barefoot. And have you, did you see that red dress she was wearing? I don't need to explain anything more. S-tier. I don't explain much why Frollo is in the S tier either, and at the top of the list, I'll tell you why. Because the world is cruel, the world is wicked. It's I alone you can trust to make a tier list. I'm your only friend. And yeah, that was a really stupid joke I just did there. But yeah, I talked about why Frollo is cleared by maybe one of the best Disney villains, and it's not hard to see why. Music. Music. Why to do that? Who knows. Anyway, you see, Hunchback songs are weighed heavily towards the top of the list. So let's go to the B tier, see the bomb song, which is A Guy Like You. Uh, I actually don't think it was that bad. There are some elements where the other two gargoyles can't really sing that well. The one guy goes, chew, he sings that really badly. But other than that, it's not really that bad. And the lyrics can be kind of stupid, like, you're shaped like a croissant, croissant is. Like, what, what, what? And then it has a stupid visual of him holding up a croissant. But it's it's sure it's sweet. Uh, it doesn't bother me at all. In fact, I think it's kind of catchy. So fuck you. And then the Court of Miracles. This is probably the most forgettable song. It, it is it is fun just to have a, a mock trial for two characters, and it is kind of funny in that way. But overall, it's one of the ones that was kind of forgettable. Then we're going on to the good ones. Topsy Turvy, which is a pretty fun song. It it uh it makes me smile ear to ear. I like I like it. Uh, 
So that's about it for Topsy Turvy. It's good, but not an S tier song. The rest of them are all S tier songs. God Help the Outcast is great, but it does have God in the title, and that bothers me. Why? Because God doesn't exist. Anyway, out there, I already mentioned how I think it's a very underrated song, and it's sung very well by Amadeus Mozart. That's a guy, that's who uh, voices Quasimodo. You know that? Yeah, you know. Not the actual guy, the guy who played him in the movie Amadeus. There you go. Anyway, The Bells of Notre Dame. Classic opening song. It's epic. It gives sets the tone for it. It's great. It ends of a high orchestra opera note, whatever you call it. I'm not very inclined to know shit, obviously. Then you got Heaven's Light, which is a very short but sweet song that follows it, the best song in the movie, and it's a great contrast. He, they're talking about the same subject matter, but one from different light, and that makes this song even better. It's nice, it's pleasant, and you feel enlightened listening to it. I swear it must be Heaven's Light. And the top of the tier, almost being very top, is Hellfire, because, oh, I mean, I already talked about why. The, the contrast between Heaven's Light and Hellfire is a great juxtaposition. I'm so glad they did that, and it's beautiful. I recommend just listen to that song, and then tell me that it doesn't belong in the tier. That's all I got to say about that. Next time, we'll be talking about Hercules. See you then.